Good morning, it's a joyous morning that we can gather together to worship. And uh, even though it's so cold outside, it looks like there is no winter, but yet our heart is warm. And uh, we like to come over here and then praise God at the bottom of our hearts. As I came in here, I, I felt the warmth and I felt the uh, joy that we have. It's so uh, special. And uh, as the Christians gather together to worship God, God's name being uplifted, God's name being praised, and as well, God's name being adored. In Psalms, so many places, St. Daniel, in the very in the morning, I'll rise, and my soul will awaken, and that my heart will pour out to God and sing praises to Him. And let us pray, and before we have the word of God, let us pray. Father, we like to gather together here, and we like to have our lips. We sing the praises to you. And Father, help us so that our hearts will be meaningful and be uh, willing to praise you because you are the only one, you are the mighty God that we like to pour our praises and no one else. And Father, help us at this moment. We ask you to cover all of us with the blood of Jesus Christ so that the word of God will be preached, will be uh, proclaimed without any hindrance. And Father, we pray that every one of us here today will pray for the retreat that the pastors gather together. And we pray for Pastor Dennis, and he is together with the other people. God, speak to him as well as you're speaking to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The message I'd like to bring to you is from the first John. First John is a perfect particular of uh, Apostle John. And then there's the, what you call the uh, second uh, written documents that we have in the New Testament. And uh, for the uh, uh, episodes of uh, First John, uh, only have five chapters, only five chapters, and it's written in the about uh, AD 70 or AD. So it is very, very good for us to remind us at this time that we're living in now. And uh, in the last several uh, weeks, uh, Pastor Dennis is preaching on worship. Worship is a big word. In the Bible, say worship is not just meaning the uh, programs that we have uh, on Sunday. Worship is from the heart of everyone who belongs to uh, God. In our words, you know, when we come to worship, it's equivalent to service. Service. So the worship is not just by words, it's also by actions. That is the same thing as in First John, when we're talking about uh, the life that we have, L-I-F-E. And I'll break it down into uh, acronyms, because it's talking about the word of life that we are having, that we are having. Life is born and brought to this world. In the middle of some, uh, one of the night that I was about you know, uh, 12 years old, I was being uh, woken by my mother. And she told me that, hey, come over. I, I'll, I'll let you show you something. So uh, she led me to the aquarium that we have. It's quite a big one, and we have different kind of fishes. And uh, in that particular middle of the night, he showed me that, uh, she showed me that you know, one of the mother fish who was giving birth to the small fishes. And it's very, very spectacular. And the other kind of fish stand around her and chase after the fish and the birth of the new lives. It's kind of sad. You see, you know, in the natural world, it's so cruel. And there is no mercy at all. And every big fish is chasing after the young ones. I could see the father fish, though the body was very tiny. Um, and he tried very, very hard to chase the predators away from the new ones, yet he failed. And watch his young ones being eaten up. Finally, my mother came to the rescue to pick up the female fish with a net and put her into an enclosure that provides safety and peaceful environment for her to continue this painful labor. The only young ones we could save was a small amount, a small number compared to those being lost minutes ago. Natural birth, yes, brings joys and uh, happiness. One generation brings forth the next. As we look back to our natural births, 
We are so uh, appreciate our parents bring us into this world and provide years of parental care till we can take care of ourselves. Even when you grow to the age of 70 or 80, if you have parents at home, they still treat you like a kid, like a kid. Similarly, our Heavenly Father gave His best for us, that we can go back to Him and have restored the relationship that He has promised us in the very, very beginning of the uh, creation. Because in the first John, chapter 1, He says, you know, the life that we are going to have, the life that we are sharing now, is not much different from before. But yet, this life is so powerful, because Apostle Paul, we, Apostle John, saying that that is the life we have seen, we have heard, and we have touched. It is a personal experience with the Word of Life, with the capital W, Word of Life. And that is very, very important. As we gather together here and worship God, we have this common, common factor, the Word of Life. And Jesus is a righteous one, and he is the uh, propitiation, a big word, and that's what is used in the first one, propitiation for our sins. Propitiation, uh, in a meaning, uh, it is the redemption, or what you call getting back to the original status. That's what you meant by the propitiation. And Greek really means satisfaction. In our personal, we are in a kind of status, not satisfied God. And we come to the state that we, whatever we do, is just like a rebellious to God. We thought we are doing good things, we thought we are good human beings, and yet we are so rebellious. So many places and so many times in Jeremiah, even though it's only 52 chapters, and yet, very explicitly say, you people suppose belong to me, and yet you're, be, uh, you're rebellious. Even one time, the king said, hey, prophet Jeremiah, tell us what is going to happen, and yet, don't tell us the bad news. If you tell us the bad news, then it's too bad. We are not going to listen to you. That's what the king warned uh, Jeremiah. But Jeremiah said, no, I cannot do anything, but I have to warn you. The God in heaven, God of Israel, God Almighty is going to punish you because you are desperately rebellious against God. And that's why the famine, the sword, and the enemies of your neighbors will come and take you in captivity. But, there is only good news coming in. If you obey God and take this 70 years as cap uh, uh, captivity, and God, will go, God is going to bring you back, bring you back, and you'll come back to this land. So don't worry, in these 70 years, go there, buy lands, build houses, have children, and then you come back after 70 years. But the king said, no way, I'm not going to do that. How can I you know, humiliate myself? and then go to the land of my enemy and live there for 70 years. But God said, at this moment, tonight, you will be the prisoners of the enemies. It's so true, that night, goodbye, goodbye. So as you can see, propitiation is satisfaction. It's satisfaction. In other words, our life is supposed to satisfy God. And so many times, now and then, we never, never come to the point. And how we can have this satisfaction in front of God? Because God has prepared Jesus to satisfy God's wrath, respect to our sins. Other words, in other words, be uh, uh, other words, uh, be equivalent to this term of propitiation, uh, atonement. Big word in the Old Testament, atonement. In other words, you need something to cover up your guilt, cover up your shortcomings and cover up all your bad things. And that's why we call it atonement, in place of you. Or it can be called, uh, similar to 
sin offering, sin offering, and forgiveness. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all the sins in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. So therefore, when we come back, hey, why do we need this kind of propitiation? We come to the word love for ever. And love from God through Jesus Christ. And God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. The great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. You see? The propitiation is not what we have done. It's not from our deeds. It's not from our thought. It's not our philosophy. But yet, it is the work of God. He provided the atonement for us. He provided Jesus so that his love is lavished on us. Not only that, the uh, propitiation is a gift. It's a gift. You don't have to do anything. It won't cost you anything. But all you have to do is by faith, you come forward to God and say, Hey, God, I want you to take it. So, number one, love is from God himself. And God is love. God is love. That's why in the first chapter of First John, it says, you know, not only God loves us, but we have to love God. We have to love God. We love because God first loves us. Uh, chapter 4, verse 19. Obey his word, love of God is truly made complete in those who belong to God. That is how we know we are in him. Chapter 2, verse 5. So in our words, you know, if we say we are Christians, if we say we are children of God, and yet we do not love God, we are lying, we are lying. He says obey his word. Love of God is truly made complete. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 2 15. It's so true. In other words, Jesus has been uh, telling us if you are serving two, uh, 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 two masters, how can you serve the world? Either you have to serve one and then give up the other. In other words, if you have a part time, and you're doing two jobs at the same time. Sometimes you will really under the stress. Not because the money you're making is not enough, but because you're serving two masters. Likewise, Jesus said, if you serve God and then you serve mom, which is the money, you are not qualified to be my followers. So here it says, do not love the world. Compare to how you're going to love God. And also in chapter 5 of 1 John, he said we have to love one another, one another. In the World War II, a Catholic priest was captured and put into a concentration camp of Nazi. When he, when he was there, he was told, your life expectancy is only seven days. And that is what the, uh, uh, happened to the uh, Catholic uh, priest in the past seven days. So you know what you have to count your days. And one of the days during the week, the one in charge said, well, I need to execute ten of the prisoners because a group of people escaped and we could not capture them. So I'll need ten of you to be the target. So, ten of them may be lying up and they draw the names. One of them numbered by 5659. 5659. Five, it designated to facing the final spot. And the priest came to the uh, captain, to the chief, saying, You know, I'm willing, I'm willing to give up my life for 5659. Five, and you say, why? Say, 5659 got a family. He's so young, and I am, uh, even though it's not that old, but I know my life is only seven days. And how much longer can I live? I'd rather give my life.
and to redeem the other Provide a way out, and then as we go to God, 
it's a good word. We always say, hey, I'm making friendship with you. And as a matter of fact, in the New Testament, Canonia, this Greek word, meaning very, very important in terms of fellowship, in terms of church. Canonia means you're a communion, sharing something in common, or we call partaker. You are the partner. We are not saying that we are doing the business, but we are in God's business. We are the partakers of God's business. Because God's kingdom depends on us. And we are the partner with God as well as partner with each other. The participation is talking about not only as a group of people. The number one, we have to partake in the knowledge of the Son of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 9. In other words, we need when we come to here to worship, we have to have the knowledge of the Son of God. In other words, we have to know God's Son has done so much for us, and we have the common ground today. Sharing is the realization of the effect of the blood and the death of Christ and the body of Christ, as set forth by the embers of the Lord's Supper. And that's why every month we come here. And come to the communion table and partake the Lord's Supper. Participation of the suffering and the death of Christ. You see, you know, when, I, when we come to church, we say, yeah, we are so joyful. We are so happy to have everyone here to worship God. And yet, we forgot one thing. In Philippians chapter 1, uh, chapter 3, verse 10, it says we have to partake of Christ's suffering. Not just the joy of being forgiven, but yet we have to partake the suffering and the death of Christ. The sharing in the resurrection as well, and that will give us the hope as in the first chapter of the first book. You see that that is the basic we partake in, and that's what we're looking forward. Our Apostle John, so, uh, Paul, so many times saying that yeah, I'll come to you, and yet, I may not be, but one day we are sure we're going to meet each other in Christ because Christ will come again in Second Thessalonians and also in Second Corinthians. See that we have the hope, we have the resurrection, and our body will be changed, and in the twinkle of eyes, we will be transformed into the likeness of Christ because Christ is the first fruit of the resurrection. And therefore, it's very, very important. Not only partake of the suffering, the uh, resurrection, and also the fellowship means we are on the journey. That is uh, the meaning of fellowship. We are on the journey. We are the what we call companionship. Travel or journey together, sharing the same destiny with the same destination. How about each other during the journey to this homeward bound of heaven? We write a lot of uh, uh, what you call the family tales, like the Wizard of the Coast, right? How many of you have read the Pilgrim's Progress? He was so lonely by himself, right? But yet, if he had companion going along, you have him out and you explain so many things what is going on. So fellowship, it begins with the Father in Jesus Christ. God is faithful and called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 1 9. And fellowship among the believers because of the same faith in Christ. And fellowship is in truth and in honesty. I'd like to do a demonstration that you know what I'm talking about. Trust me, it is milk. Uh, even though I cannot drink it because I uh, cannot tolerate the uh, lactose. <laughs> it's a milk. It's homogeneous, as you can see. But maybe you drink one and it's not that particular. You can see this one is milk, right? Milk represents a group of Christians, homogeneous. We are seeing faith in God. We share the bread of Jesus Christ. We are the same propitiation from God. At 
and yet, when you just put a little bit of something into it, say like you know when we try to fellowship and come up with different kind or different nature of food. Oh. 